online and we'll I think my battery's dead. Okay, you're on. All right, I'll talk through Pastor Johnny's mic for just a little bit. And thank you, Charlene. It's getting me a, a mic, battery. Um, if we could, let's stand up, please, if you will, if you're able. Hallelujah. Hey, everybody online as well. We'll talk to y'all again at the break. There's some stuff we want to say to y'all, so welcome from all over the world. Yay. All right, if you would, everybody just lift your hands to the Lord for just a second. Father, we bless you, we praise you, we thank you that you are here. Your presence, God, is, is the atmosphere of heaven. And so tonight, Lord, sweep through this place. Move in our lives, God. Father, we thank you that we're able to study spiritual warfare, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of the kingdom of God and for our benefit. It's not just for our benefit, but there's a major benefit to it. And so tonight, Lord, as we come to this lesson, I pray that you awaken our souls, our minds, our wills, our emotions. Awaken us, Father, that we can see what you see, hear what you hear, so that, Father God, we can do what you want us to do and represent you in this earth. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Have, has everybody hugged somebody? Can you hug somebody? And then y'all can be seated. Hallelujah. Just hug somebody. Glory. Glory, glory. And then open your manuals to part three. If you haven't already. Part three. Okay. The War. Ed Murphy wrote a book, a manual on spiritual warfare years ago. And one of the things that he said was, The war has been won, but our enemy isn't dead. He isn't even sick. And, and that is so the truth, and, and we know it to be true. There's a difference. Somebody can have charges pressed against them legally, but they're still healthy and strong and can still operate illegally. Does anybody, anybody know that? Jesus, you know, if you become a believer, you notice your problems aren't just dismissed immediately. You still have to war in the body. You still have to war in different ways. And so just because you're a believer doesn't mean all problems have been dismissed. Thank you so much. So the war is still on. The war has been won, but the battles are still being fought. All right, so we're going to talk about for a few minutes the spirit realm. This is part one of part three, or, or Roman numeral one. Let me ask you something. What color is your toothbrush? Pink. Some of you orange. Now, how many of you didn't immediately know what color your toothbrush was because you forgot? But then you had to think about it. What color is your car? How many of y'all know immediately the answer to that question? Um, the reason is we are, and let me ask you a third question, and then I'll give you some input about that. What does the spiritual gate around Decatur look like? See, here's the thing. We all, we all get a look whenever I ask that. When I say, what does the spiritual gate look like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which part of Decatur? All right. See, one of the things that happens, it's built with beer cans. Okay, okay, let's get back to the subject. One of the things that happens is we know what we are taught to observe. We know what we're taught to observe. We're taught to observe our toothbrush. Because how many of y'all know we don't want a toothbrush? Hopefully we have a teeth brush. But if we... It's a joke there. Anyway, <laughs> we're taught to know the color of our car because if we go out and we don't know what our car looks like and we forget every time we walk in and out of a place, you get confused. And it's bad. If you've ever, we have two cars in our household. There's some days that I think about driving my truck and then we, we go to Walmart and we've taken his car and I'm looking for my truck. Has anybody ever had that experience? You're looking for the wrong vehicle. We are taught to know what we observe. And we live 99% of our lives in the natural realm. Everything you've done today, 99% of it, has been natural. 
You've come into a natural building. You've sat in a natural chair. You've observed natural activities. You've interacted with natural people. You've eaten natural food. So sometimes we don't know how, and we forget how, and sometimes we just never are taught how to walk in the Spirit. So when we go into places and something's happening, we don't know how to govern that spirit realm. We don't know how to do it. We don't know how to operate in it. Last week, we talked about there are three heavens. There's the first heaven, which goes as far as we can possibly can conceive. We don't even know what's on the other side uh, in the natural. Of, uh, I don't even know how to explain it, but the universe is so massive and so immense, the first heaven, just the first one, that we don't even know what so many planets and galaxies and suns and stars even look like. So there's a, that's just the first one. There's a second one, and it's the spirit realm. And guess what? There's a third one, and that's heaven. And we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. But the spirit realm is so immense, and it's so profound, and it's, it's overlaid. How many of y'all, if you, when you were kids, you had those storybooks where you overlaid the clear plastic, and it added dimensions to the story? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You have a, a page that everything's set on, and then you take a piece of clear plastic, and it has a drawing on it, and it overlays it, and then it overlays it, and then by the time you're done, you have a complete picture. That's what the spirit realm is. We live 99% of our lives on the base page. We don't know the extra layers because we've not been taught to see them. We've not been taught to understand them. And we've not been taught to listen to Holy Spirit to learn how to navigate in them. And so as we're talking about the spirit realm, I want you to be very, very aware that when we begin to talk about it, when we talk about spiritual warfare, we have to address the spirit realm because that's where the resistance is. Good example, even yet again, how many of you have ever come into New Covenant and, and it felt like you were almost in a completely different church from one week to the next? Maybe not because of the people or the exuberance, but you'd walk in and it felt like we were in a different place. Your house, your work, it felt like you were in a different place, even different stores. It's because the spirit realm is always in extra dimensional activity. There's always extra dimensional activity going on above us and around us. And we don't know what's happening. And sometimes it feels like we've entered into. How many of y'all have ever heard the expression of preacher, preacher? Ah, you're coming in. Oh, ah, to a new season. Oh, ha. Ah. And, and you were like, yay, God, that means I'm getting more money. I mean, that's what we often think when they say you're coming into a new season. But in the spirit realm, there are seasons. There are climates. There's, there's atmospheres. There's, there's activity going on. There's gates. There's mountains. There's territories. There's rain. There's All of these things are going on in the heavenly realm, in the spirit realm. And here you see it, the heavens, there's a third heaven. Who has 2 Corinthians 12 too? Did anybody get that? Somebody? No one does. Okay. Sure, that's great. Um, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether... Oh, I was... That's okay. You can read the next one. Uh, okay, verse 8. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I, I do not know, but God knows. Okay. All right. So, Paul is writing... And he's writing about the, um, excuse me one second, let me draw this out. He's writing about the third heaven. Now, this is the tabernacle. Whenever uh, God gave to Moses a, a template, he said, I want you to build the tabernacle. And it's a template of what heaven looks like. And it's made up of three segments, three components. There's the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. So if you're studying the spirit realm, it's, it's uh, a good thing to get a grasp that the tabernacle ap actually represents the first, second, and third heaven. Now, thank you. All right, this is the first heaven, which is the natural. Now, it's not by coincidence that Moses has that outside of a tent. It's outside. It's where fire happens. It's where flesh dies. It's where blood is shed, and it's made of bronze. It's a more basic, more base atmosphere. 
is outside. It was smelly. It was in the earth. Does this make sense? So this represents the earth realm and the universe as we know it. Natural universe. Everything we know. Is Jupiter in the natural universe? Yes. Is earth, is the moon, and everything. It's right here. This is what represents this. Second heaven represents the spirit realm. Now, this is, is the spirit realm. Any, uh, when you're talking about the spirit realm, you have to understand that it's more than just made up of these parts, but these symbolize different aspects of the spirit realm. This is where the war is going to take place because the first heaven wants to connect to the third heaven, and the third heaven wants to connect to the first heaven, but in between, there's a second heaven. This is the spirit realm. This is where, whenever Jesus died, what veil was torn? This one right here. To rip open the way for us to move straight through the first and second into the third. And, and I could go more into that and we will eventually. There's just so much to this that I want to get through tonight. But I, I want you to understand that the first heaven is represented by the outer court. The second heaven is represented by the holy place. And the third heaven is represented here. Whenever, right now, you are seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly places. According to Ephesians. This is where you are in your spirit. You're already there. You're not trying to get from here to there. You're already there. But your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions, and your body are still tied to here. Does this make sense? So when you're trying to get your mind, your will, and your emotions connected to here, there's a passing through this dimension that has to take place. There's a second heaven. This is why the enemy attacks your mind. This is why there's such a war going on for your mind, your will, and your emotions. Because your spirit's already connected to the third heaven, and your body and your soul is in the first one, and you're trying to align everything that remains here with the there. If we ever learn that we're already above everything that could hinder us from getting forward, we're already above it, we're already past it, we've already moved through, the veil's already been torn. If we ever grasp that, then not only will we live a happier, more joyful life, we're going to help other believers live happier, more joyful lives. We'll look at them as they're going through struggles and we'll empathize and we'll pray and we'll believe for them, but we'll be able to say, you're far above all of this. Is this making sense? But the enemy tries, and, and he is lodged in the second heaven, in, the, in the, the second heaven, in the spirit realm, trying to hinder us from being able to move forward. Now, in the spirit realm, the Holy Spirit dwells there as well. Angels dwell there. Ephesians 6.12 says, principalities, powers, rulers of wickedness um, dwell there. This is extraordinary alignment and order, even though they produce chaos. What am I trying to say by that? The enemy has extraordinary alignment. Now, what are the three, what are the chief things that the enemy's trying to do in our lives? Kill, steal, and destroy. Now, it seems like that the enemy operates out of chaos to do all of that. But the enemy has extraordinary order, extraordinary strategies and order. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for warfare, when we're talking about spiritual warfare, the Greek word is stratia. Stratia, which means strategies. The enemy has extraordinary strategies. And, and give you an example of that. How many of y'all know that sometimes when you're coming to a rough season in your life, somebody will say the absolute worst possible thing to fuel that? So what happens is the enemy is, it knows you. The enemy knows you, and he strategizes. And, and his whole alignment of the kingdom of darkness knows when you're about to go through a hard time. And he will assign people to say the dumbest things to you in your worst times. Is this right? So he's extraordinary aligned. The devil's not running around going, bah! As a matter of fact, whenever... whenever <laughs> A lot of times people are saying, oh, I can't watch that scary movie. You know, the devil's going, Bleh, and all this kind of stuff in it. I'm like, I'm not scared of the devil that's going, Bleh. the one that makes me nervous is the one that walks up to me and calls me friend. It's the calm ones that's undermining. That's where the warfare's taking place. It's amazing alignment in the kingdom of darkness. Boy, that was, that was a word of knowledge. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 2.11. Somebody who has that one? 
We're going to stop right after part three real quick or right after part two and a answer any questions you may have because I just covered a lot of information very quick. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Okay. So we must study warfare in the Bible, and it is one of the most talked about subjects because we don't want to be ignorant of his schemes. We want to know the spirit realm. I, I want to know Jesus. But I also want to be familiar. What is that? I rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. It does. Jesus' name. All right, so let's keep going. See? <laughs> okay. That's similar to when the fly tried to attack me standing right over there. Anyway, we'll move on. Um, where was I at? Okay, we study warfare because we need to know the enemy's strategies. We do not want to be ignorant of these things. All right, so now, are there any questions so far? I know I've covered a lot of information. I've went from the tabernacle to the spirit realm. We could talk about gates, mountains, territories, climates, rains. Does everybody understand that the natural realm is a reflection of the spirit realm. That if we could see into the spirit realm right now, even the second heaven, not just the third one, but the second one, there are territories and dimensions and space and areas that, that I don't even know how to explain it. You know, if you're driving down I-75, you go through Valdosta, you go through, you know, Tallahassee, not Tallahassee, but you go through all these different cities as you're going down I-75 all the way to Florida. Then you get to beach side there. The spirit realm is very similar. It has territories. It has dimensions. And God has called the church to rule and reign both in this realm, that realm, and to be seated with Christ above all things. Does that make sense? Are there any questions? That is the craziest sound. Ask that question again. Is there one level that these things are in or are they in all of them? I would say they're definitely in all of them. Just like they're definitely territories and climates and things in the first heaven, there's in the second as well as the third. Okay. Any other questions? This second heaven is where the strongholds are built. So if you go into cities and you go into areas, if you drive into New Orleans... There is a different uh, territory, spiritual territory, that you enter into that's right above the city than if you entered into New York or Las Vegas or Atlanta. They all have different spiritual territories right above. Now, this is going to make sense when we start talking about spiritual warfare, our side of it, because we don't just go into a place just to sit under it. We go into a place to rule and reign in it. Okay? All right. So we're going to move on to part three of part three, and it says principalities and demons, how they receive their names. They receive their names through the law of first mention and qualities. Ephesians 6, 12 says, if we war not against flesh and blood, uh, when the Bible shows us flesh and blood and a war, then we can assume there's an enemy influencing the situation. Okay, let me explain what that passage or what that statement means. Ephesians six twelve says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not the enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So when we go back to the Bible, all of a sudden, and, and let me tell you, how many of y'all know that uh, my 90-day Bible project that I did a couple of years ago? Some of you do. I went through the Bible, and I had highlighters, and I highlighted every subject that kept repeating itself. So, and I wanted to see what was on God's mind. So I highlighted a lot of blood and a lot of worship and a lot of prayer. And I started seeing, but I started seeing one color specifically. And it was orange. And guess what orange is? Warfare. It was war. I began to see that in the garden, there was a war. There was Satan trying to tempt Adam and Eve. Right outside the garden, there was a war. It was between Cain and Abel. Two brothers came against each other because one was jealous of another. And then right out of that, the war began. And you can't hardly read a chapter of the Bible without there being some war. 
And so people come to me and they ask me, they say, Pastor, there's wars all the time. It seems like everybody's fighting and everything. In the New Testament, we learn that the Scriptures tell us that all of that was given to us so that we could see a higher reality. The tabernacle wasn't just a natural trailer that moved around the desert in the Old Testament. It was something in the natural that taught us a higher spiritual lesson. When we see the wars all through the Bible, we begin to see that God is trying to teach us something about the spiritual warfare that we go through. So all of those wars were to teach believers how to war in the Spirit. So whenever you start going through the Bible now, when you read Genesis to Revelation, start looking at the wars differently. Quit looking at the the natural whenever, you know, some of the wars were fought. They were just ugly and nasty. Start interpreting some of the names and find out what the strategies were of the enemy in those wars. And you'll see something about your enemy and how it is you're supposed to fight. Whenever the children of Israel were coming against another nation, God said, send the worshipers out first, and all of them sabotage themselves. That was not to teach us that we're, you know, necessarily, that we uh, fight wars in the natural with worship. But we certainly fight them in the spiritual with worship first. Does that make sense? So it's, it's to teach us a lesson. So when we're going through the Bible, we begin to see different influences that are there and we need to learn what their names are. Now, here's the importance of knowing what you're dealing with. Somebody read Mark 5, 8 through 10 for me. Oh, hold on one second, brother. Let, let Elijah get you some microphone. That's okay. For Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legions, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Okay, keep the microphone for just a second. Read that first verse one more time. And then keep the microphone because I'm going to have you read it step by step. For Jesus said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Okay, Jesus looked at an evil spirit that was tormenting a man and he said, come out. Now, if you know who Jesus is and everybody in here does, when Jesus says come out... How many of y'all know the only response of that spirit is to? But look at the next verse. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? Okay, it didn't come out. He said, come out. And it didn't. So he engaged it. And he said, what is your name? My name is Legions, he replied, for we are many. Now, He needed to know what he was dealing with in order for it to come out. Here's why. There was legal ground for those spirits to be in that place. Now, I'm about to tell you why. All right, y'all ready? There's some real revelation here. He was in a land that was predominantly Jewish. Now, look down a little further in that passage. What did he cast the spirits into? A herd of pigs. Look at your neighbor and ask this question. What were pigs doing in in Jewish land? (laughs) Okay. Okay, so just step back a few steps. Were pigs lawful for Jewish people to have? No. Who commanded them not to have pigs? God. God said, you're not to touch the flesh of swine. Now, you may sit there and go, well, I had bacon this morning for breakfast. This doesn't apply to you because under the new covenant, it's different. But when Jesus was dealing with his spirit, he was dealing with Jewish pig farmers. So this spirit had lodged into somebody in the middle of a land where they had opened the door for that thing to come in. So Jesus said, come out. It didn't dislodge. He had to find the legal ground where it was was at for him to dislodge it. So guess where that spirit petitioned to be cast into? The pigs. Guess what happened to the pigs after this legal transaction was done? They ran off the edge of a cliff and destroyed themselves. So the whole legal transaction was done. Now, in, th- in this group of people, 
I want to explain to you. When we disobey God's commands, we open the door for demonic influences to come into our territories. And so all of a sudden, we're walking around, and we're born again, spirit-filled believers, walking in defeat, walking in destruction, walking in a lack of victory. We don't have any joy. Because somewhere along the lines, we open the door for an influence to come in, and it's lodged in our lives. We can, we can be completely holy and living a life set apart for God, but still have one unsurrendered area. And this is why Jesus needed to find out its name and then make the whole legal transaction, get the pigs over the cliff, and then that thing was completely dismissed from this person's life because it was in the, he was in the territory that this thing had, had set up camp. Does this make sense to everybody? Now this is, you've got to identify it before you can deal with it. This is why Freedom Challenge is so important. If you, if you haven't gone through it or anything like that, you probably need to sign up for it. Because what it does is it starts looking. Are y'all cold? Is, is everybody is everybody okay temperature wise? Is cold? Okay. All right. So what we need to do is we have to go back and we have to discover the roots of why some things are in our lives and dismiss them. If you're struggling with relationships, and one after another after another after another after another keeps failing, after the eighth or tenth one, you need to look at the root. Need to go back and find out what's going on. If jobs are constantly cycling out and you never can keep a job, never, ever, ever, and there's, you've gone through 20 in the past six months, then there, there's a root there. There's legal territory. All right. So we need to make sure that we understand what we're dealing with in the spirit. Now, look at the next one. Uh, letter B there, legion, the name and quality. So the spirit's name wasn't necessarily one spirit, it was many. So it was named legion. Okay? Look at, uh, uh, well, don't look there, but I'll just call it out. Job 41, 34, Leviathan. Now, in, when we start dealing with principalities and powers in the next few chapters, we're going to talk more about Leviathan and how he's the sea serpent. And you sit there and you go, what? Is that Nessie? Is that Loch Ness monster? What is that? Leviathan, well, kind of, but we'll talk more about that when we get there. But its, its job is to choke out the rivers, the flow of the Spirit. Have you ever been wanting to pray in the Spirit and it felt like it was lodged right there and you were being choked? It's Leviathan. And we'll go more into that when we talk about principalities and powers. The Spirit of Heaviness, Isaiah 61.3. Uh, There are spirits of heaviness that are set up around regions. I've been to countries around this world whenever I went into the cities of those countries and into territories, I could say, boy, the primary principality here is a spirit of heaviness because I could feel the heaviness in the air. I could feel it. And when you're dealing in warfare, you've got to know what you're dealing with. Behemoth is another one, and we'll talk about him in the coming weeks. Moloch, 2 Kings 23.10. In the Old Testament, you're going to read, when you start reading, you're going to read about Moloch. Now, there were two things that Moloch uh, was sacrificed to. There are two things that they sacrificed to Moloch. Babies and um, certain bodily fluids that come from men. I know, right? They would put them in jars and they would throw them in the fire in the, the, the temple of Moloch. And they would put babies in there as well. Now, you sit there and you go, well, now, what is that about? Moloch is still alive and well today in the spirit realm. What Moloch does in his primary strategy, and we'll talk about it, is to try to destroy the next generation. So when we come together as a church, the seed of the word of God is going forth, and Moloch's primary strategy is to steal the seed before it can get into our hearts and also to destroy new believers. When you become a new believer, how many of y'all know one of the first challenges is that people upset you? Another strategy of the enemy, whenever you become a new believer, is you don't feel God anymore. How many of y'all remember that first time after you become a believer that all of a sudden you didn't feel God and the enemy tried to come in and steal you from the household of faith? Moloch, 
Python, we'll talk about him, Jezebel. These are all principalities and powers that get their names because of their attributes. So whenever you are sitting there in the congregation and somebody at New Covenant Church of Atlanta may stand up and say something like this, I come against Leviathan in the name of Jesus. And you're sitting there going, who? Come against what? Isn't that the name of the movie from 1988? Leviathan, and you're sitting there and you don't know what's happening. This is what's happening. We're warring against spirits. It's not necessarily a natural thing. It's a spiritual thing. Even the spirit of infirmity. It's a quality and a name. It's mentioned in Luke 13, 11. And I encourage you to go back, you online and all of you here, to go back and read each, about each one of these things that's listed here. Because in the next couple of weeks, like next week, we're going to start naming off principalities and powers and we're going to go through their attributes and how to repent of any covenants we've made with them well that's going to be good all right so the spirit of infirmity it's a quality and a name uh kenneth hagan was was praying for somebody one time and he commanded the person to be healed and they weren't and he did it again and they weren't and he kept doing it and they weren't and he's like i believe you have a spirit of infirmity and the person said what do you mean they said, well, you've made a covenant. And this person was always complaining about their health. They were always talking about how bad they felt. They were always saying with their mouths, oh, this was the phrase they used, I'll have to die to get better. And they were speaking that. And as they spoke that, their words came into covenant with this spirit of infirmity that lodged itself legally. That's a big word. Everybody say legally. Into their lives. And no matter how many times he tried to rebuke it, and, and, and de- or how many times he declared the healing, the healing didn't come because this person had made a covenant with their own health with a spirit of infirmity. So when we're do- dealing with spiritual warfare, there will be times where you come against principalities and powers and you confront them head on and it won't feel like they've moved at all. You won't sense any release or any freedom. That's when you have to get into the legal territory like we talked about with Legion. Does this make sense? All right. Now, I'm going to stop here before we go into warfare strategies, and I'm going to ask, are there any questions? We're going through a lot of information. Yes, Christy. To me, Bishop, like a lot of things that we've discussed tonight, I've seen, like, you know, just examples from, like, uh, the secret you know, and like the law of attraction. And like basically pretty much anything you say, you can bind yourself to God or you can bind bind yourself to like bad covenants. And I've been thinking a lot about that since like last week. And now it's like um, I tell my girlfriend all the time, like some of the things we say, we bind God, good or bad, Mm -hmm. he will do. And that's kind of like the law of attraction, so to speak. So if you speak positive things that the Lord will provide. I, I really truly believe that with all my heart. Like you said, like when you do the things that you're supposed to do, you bind the Lord. He wants to be bound to us. Yeah. He's more than happy to do that. And it's like, uh, what I've learned is, like, when we do things, we attract God to us. Right? That's right. Amen. That is exactly right. Now, I do want to give a little bit of a warning here um, and a caution. When we start dealing with some of the New Age stuff and 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 stuff like that, we may begin to get into an area where we open portals for the enemy to piggyback that. Um, I want to encourage y'all, always through the blood of Jesus, always through the blood of Jesus, always through the blood, and make sure you, you trace it back to that because that's the foundation, the purity of the blood of Jesus. Everybody say, the blood of Jesus. Amen, amen. But that's right. We bind God to ourselves, and, 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 and when we begin to declare things and speak things, God can use our words when they're aligned with his word. Absolutely. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, warfare strategies, number four. Now, okay, as we get into this, and, and there's a little bit more detail here, there's individual demonization and territorial demonization, where the enemy begins to, to uh, and we're going to talk about this in part four right after the break, but individual demonization, Acts sixteen eighteen, Jesus said you can cast out devils, so that, you, you know, people get individually demonized, and then Mark five fifteen we see an individual demon affecting people. Now, 
Demons can affect both believers and non-believers, but I want to talk to you about the difference, okay? Believers in Jesus cannot be possessed. All right, I want everybody to say this after me. Believers in Jesus... Oh, okay, say it with me. Believers in Jesus cannot be possessed. Now, I want you to say this. But, believers in Jesus can be oppressed. There's a difference between possession and oppression. Now, here's the thing about the difference. Sometimes they don't look that different. I have been talking to believers that I know were saved and filled with the Spirit. And they come unglued. And they start acting like somebody that was possessed. Now, here's the difference. I want to I tell you. I want to show you real quick. So, okay. Here's a person who is a non-believer. They have a mind. They have a spirit. And they live in a body. A non-believer, the enemy can go into their mind and, pos- and, and begin to oppress it so much that they open themselves up to possession. Now, that's, I, I haven't seen a whole lot of possession in my life, but I've seen it some. Don't be afraid of it. You don't have to. You're a believer in Jesus. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Now, believers in Jesus over here, their spirits belong to the king of glory. Cannot be touched, blood marked. But their minds, their wills, and emotions are progressively being saved. By the word of God. So the enemy can get a stronghold in here. In the mind, the will, and the emotions. Especially when we open up legal territory. When we begin to say things and do things. That are outside of the will of God for our lives. When people are bound to sinful behavior. Then all of a sudden it opens a door for the enemy to come in. And, and, and begin to attach to their minds. I've seen it like this when I've seen in the spirit. There have been believers that I've been praying for. And it would look like a crow. Or, or some type of bird with their claws in, on their heads. Now I'm, I know people who've said. I feel like I've got this vice script on my head. And it's, it's the enemy trying to get legal territory to, to influence their decision-making processes, to cloud their minds, to cloud their way of thinking. And so that's what opens that up to that. Have you ever seen a really, really super confused believer that no matter how much you talk to them, they never can quite get it because they don't want to seemingly. They seem to not want to, but you talk to them more and more and more, but they continue in a spirit of confusion. They open themselves up to it more and more and more. Anybody with me on that? Where they get aggravated and and they get frustrated. The enemy somehow has gotten a hold of them with a spirit of confusion. We can renounce it. We can break it off. And and all of a sudden, I've seen this before where people all of a sudden get great clarity. When that spirit's broken off. Um, Other things like that. So so individual demonization, believers and non-believers can be tormented by the enemy. Territorial. Now, before I move on to territorial, Alton has a question. Can you grab him? Let me just talk about territorial real quick while, she, while he's getting to you with the microphone. Daniel 10, 13 talks about a territorial spirit. And 10, 20. And Acts 16, 16 through 22. And we'll talk about that in territorial spirits part 4. And then Acts 5, Acts 8, 5 through 24. And Acts 12, 1 through 24. Go ahead, Alton. My question has to do with... I, uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, I have special needs students. Yes. And most of them are in the age of 13, 14. And I have at least two that cannot read, but they constantly have their Bibles, flipping through their Bibles, but they're always talking. When they don't have the Bibles, they're talking to somebody. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. hoping and praying it's God sure. or an angel, but they're constantly talking to someone. Mm-hmm. Could that be demonic or... I would say this about people who are certainly special needs. There's a third component of our lives, and it's body. Body, soul, and spirit. Spirit, soul, and body. Sometimes there are chemical imbalances that are not spiritual at all. Sometimes there are chemical influences, brain damage, and things like that that cause this that are not spiritual. Um, I would venture to say 90 to 99% of most people who struggle like that, um, it's purely biological and not spiritual. Occasionally it is spiritual. Um, and, and so you just use your discernment and the way you deal with it is you pray for them. I would pray for healing and, and complete restoration in their lives. 
That's how I deal with it. Amen? Is that a good answer? I like it. Okay. So territorial spirits. So what did we just say? We talked about how the enemy can get into an individual's life this way. Is everybody with me? Okay. Now, take the body, the human body, and globalize it. So we have a globe. And just the same way the enemy can get into an individual's life, the enemy can also get into territories and regions. Now, in Daniel chapter 10 and verse... 13 and verse 20 there's a specific spirit that comes um unreal okay so there's a specific thing that's attacking uh the region that daniel's in and it's called the prince of persia now that's more than just a jake gyllenhaal movie that's actually it's a spirit that that's talked about in daniel 10 nobody saw that movie so okay okay you did amen all right so it's the prince of persia and an angel from the throne of god is released to give the answer to daniel but in the second heaven that we've been talking about there's this principality called the prince of persia that is somehow withstanding this angel and for 21 days and i don't know what it looks like this angel was trying to get by you're the angel Carla, come here. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. You're the angel. You're coming from the throne room of God, and you're trying to get to, Brother Jim, go up here real quick. This is Daniel. He's been praying. Now, let me tell you the strategy of what happened here. Daniel, the print, the, the, the children of Israel are there in, in Persia. They're being held captive. And Daniel reads the scriptures. And he said, it's time for this to be over. He finds a prophecy and the Word of God says, Daniel, well, it does say Daniel. The Word of God says, this will be this long. And Daniel goes, it's time for it to be over. So he opens his mouth and, and legally begins to say, God, you said it's this much time and now it's over. So the angel gets released from heaven to come and release the children of Israel. But I'm going to pretend to be the prince of Persia. He has legal territory still, and he's fighting to try to keep the angel from getting to Daniel with the answer. I don't know what it looks like for spiritual beings to wrestle, but they were fighting. So the angel was trying to get through, and 21 days later, because this angel goes back to heaven, grabs Michael, the archangel, the warring angel, they come back, and the prince of Persia goes, ah, and runs off, and they're able to get through to the answer, and Daniel and the children of Israel begin to come out of the bondage they're in. They were double teamed. Amen. So, okay, y'all can sit down. Thank you so much. So there are territorial spirits over cities, countries, communities. And we see this through cultural transference. Those who move from one country to another, the demonic strongholds will follow. We can talk more about that later. But the world, the age, and the system. So territorial spirits rule over regions. And so as the children of God, we need to begin to discover our covenant begin to speak it and begin to declare it and that's what releases the angelic host to be able to come and war on our behalf and begin to deconstruct the strongholds cheshire bridge road is beginning to i keep coming back to this but it's why we're here is beginning to look naturally different i remember when people were coming through here um and coming to church and everything they'd say i didn't even know there was green space outside I didn't even know there was this big field up here. It's so pretty. There's a big field and trees. Because all I ever saw was the clubs. All I ever saw was, was these, these places that you go to. And so all of a sudden people begin to see the beauty of it. What's happening? It's because the kingdom of God is increasing in this territory. And these principalities, these territorial spirits that's been hovering over this region are beginning to lose their grip and be dislodged from this area. Does this make sense? Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Woo! All right. I got to zip on through this really quick. Stronghold, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. Um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we have to operate where we not only pull down strongholds individually, but we also pull down strongholds regionally and territorially. Now, God wants to deputize every one of you as intercessors. 
intercessors. Come on, Pastor Joe, you better applaud. Amen. God wants to deputize each one of you to be intercessors. In, the, in Joshua, God spoke to Joshua and said, Everywhere you tread, that territory will, you will possess. Now, that was in the natural. In the spiritual, now as intercessors, we tread through our prayer lives and we begin to possess the territory. I want the kingdom of God to own Cheshire Bridge all the way from Highway or Interstate 85 all the way up to Piedmont and beyond. But we've got to get victory in this territory. As intercessors, as prayer warriors, you can do more by getting out and prayer walking your community, your area, because you're beginning to do warfare. And don't just address demons. Pray, worship God. As you worship God, that automatically begins to part the spiritual darkness and begins to remove. Now, when we prayer walk Cheshire Bridge Road, if you see businesses, we need to repent on behalf of the land. So, for example, if I see a sex club, I prayer walk by going, God, please forgive the sexual activity that's done in this territory outside of covenant. Please forgive us. Please forgive us. And see, I'm saying us, even though I don't participate in it, I'm doing identificational repentance. Because guess what? I live in this territory. I may not participate, but it's still my people. Does this make sense? So I go out, and if all of us begin to walk around and the sound begins to be released, God, forgive us. Forget not God, forgive them. It's God, forgive us. As we begin to do that, God, forgive us as a people. Forgive us as a territory. Forgive us as a city. Forgive us, God. God, Jesus didn't teach us to pray, my Father who art in heaven. He taught us to pray, our Father. It's identificational. So we begin to pray, God, forgive us of our trespasses. Forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. And as we do, the legal ground begins to break. How many of us have prayer walked Cheshire Bridge Road in the past seven weeks and repented on behalf of the land? Not many of us. Maybe some, but not many. We need to get back to that. We need to get back to the roots of saying Joshua Joshua declares, the word, the word declares, everywhere the soles of my feet tread, I will possess the land. So as a warfare church, and look at your neighbor and say, you look like a warrior to me. You do. As a warfare church, as a warfare church, we need to begin to declare war on the powers of the enemy. Jesus has already legally defeated them already so their legal status has already been revoked all that's holding it in place is people's participatory actions and if we'll repent on behalf of that it'll begin to dislodge and here's what they'll start doing when they're in those places why am i doing this all right okay let's move forward we begin to tear down the strongholds, both individual and territorially. I like the word participatory. Um, number six, strategies of the enemy. Temptation to sin, soul ties, fear, idolatry. Um, these are all temptations of the enemy, strategies of the enemy to get us to get into covenant with demonization. If we, if we begin to refuse sin, the temptation... If we break off soul ties, now, again, I encourage you to go through Freedom Challenge to find out what soul ties are. I'll give you a brief teaching on soul ties. Here it is, very brief. What is your soul? Mind, will, and emotions. A soul tie is any activity that creates a bond between my will, my mind, and my emotions with somebody else that what they do truly affects what I think and do. Now, there can be healthy soul ties and there can be unhealthy soul ties. An unhealthy soul tie is that if I can't live, if somebody looks at me wrong, if they look at me and I go, oh, I've done something to offend them, I've done something, my soul is tied to them in an unhealthy way somehow because I, I'm so scared that I've done something to hurt them. It's an unhealthy soul tie. The enemy tries to come in to bind our souls to other people so that the fear of man, and that's the scripture says the fear of man is a snare of the soul. All of a sudden we become so fearful of people that our soul is snared and we're not willing to obey God anymore. That's the strategy of the enemy to get a stronghold in our lives and in the lives of others and in territories. 
Fear, the spirit of fear tries to come in to keep us from moving forward. Idolatry, anything we set up before God. I have seen people set relationships and marriages and dating up before God, and it becomes an idol. So that they come to church, and they're like, I can't dance. Because if I dance, this one's going to think I look foolish. Already the enemy has come in with an idol and has caused us to not obey God. Does this make sense? These are the strategies of the enemy. Number seven, kingdom strategies for victory. Prayer and fasting, number one. Letter A, prayer and fasting. If we will develop a strong prayer and fasting life, we will begin to deconstruct the strongholds in territories. Go back to Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. Look at everywhere the children of Israel and the people of God began to pray and fast. It it began to deconstruct the power of the enemy. Worship and shouting. Everybody go, hey! If we will learn how to shout... You know, there are times whenever I'll get up here and I'll go like this. No joke. I'll say, give a shout unto God. And there's a loud roar. And there's about 30, 20, 20 to 30 percent that's standing there like this. And then I go up to them. And I've done this through the years. Hey, why didn't you shout when we were all shouting? They'll go like this. I did. I'll go. They'll say, I did. And I go, you didn't release the sound. You didn't release the sound. And they're like, sure I did. And I'm like, no, you didn't. I'm sure I shouted. They will believe that they made an external sound even when they didn't. So the enemy tries to get us sidetracked and tries to get us imagining so many things that we don't even know that we've not done it. We think we have when we haven't. I'll keep going. All right. Repentance and forgiveness. This is a kingdom strategy. God forgive us. Forgive us. And releasing each other. I mean, I want everybody to go home and think about people we need to forgive. Let's make it a project. The next seven days, days of forgiveness. And we, we actively somehow repent to people and forgive them and release them from, uh, from the offense that we've been holding against them. Weapons. The armor and the word, and you can read all of those as you go through them. The armor, put on the armor every single day. The name, the blood, oh, glory to God. Everybody say, in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus will tear down strongholds. The blood of Jesus, Revelation 12, 11 says, we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The blood of Jesus. Uh, I like what Mark Hankins says. He says, I don't, I don't just apply or plead the blood. I sling blood everywhere. So we need to get into it. Listen, if we're going to really start saying, now some people get uncomfortable with this because this isn't, you know, all about love and fluff. This is blood and war. So when we start talking about the blood of Jesus, this is the way we do warfare. So everybody say, I plead the blood of Jesus. It's blood and war. Hallelujah. All right, prayer walking, getting out, walking around. Now, words of caution. Don't take on what you've not been called to address. There's choices of individuals, regions, and communities. So, for example, if if somebody you know is operating in a spirit of addiction, before you cast that out, make sure they're ready to receive the freedom. And you probably need to get counsel because here's what happens. A lot of people will go up to people and they'll say, can I pray for you? They're like that and just lay hands. There's a reason the Word of God says don't lay hands on somebody suddenly. So if you see something functioning in someone's life, I'll use you as an No, yeah, well, I'll revert. If Pastor Johnny, okay, I'm going to use me as an example. If Pastor Johnny sees me, and I'm going to use a real example, even though this isn't me, (laughs) <laughs> okay, it's somebody else. Okay, say, I'm walking around, and I'm, I'm releasing curses all the time, just cussing up one side and down the other. And then he comes, he comes to me and says, and I've seen this before, you know, you probably need to watch the words of your mouth. And I go, why? Because you're releasing a lot of foul language. No, I'm not. 
I've seen the enemy so grip people's minds that they don't even know they're doing it. Have you ever seen somebody cussing and they didn't even know they were doing it? Or it lying and didn't even know they were doing it? Have you ever known somebody who's told you a straight up lie and they look you right in the face and you knew they knew that that wasn't the truth, but in their mind they were telling you the truth even though they know it wasn't reality? Has anybody ever seen somebody that's deceived themselves? Yeah, these are strongholds of the enemy. Now, if you address it and cast it out and break it off, it may move. But Jesus said, if you do that and they don't prepare themselves for it, it'll come back seven times worse than the first. So before we begin to deal with things that aren't ours to deal with, we need to pray for them. And if they come to us and say, I need some help, will you pray for me and, and deal with this? Then we can take them through the process, and, and I'll encourage you to talk to our freedom challenge folks about the process there listen it's a science it is a science freedom challenge has the word on it and they really have some great understanding about how to get people into deliverance but you 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 can lay hands on them and when they come to that place and you can cast it out but if you do be aware of this if they're not prepared to receive it it'll come back seven times worse than the first all right so don't address something that's not yours to address Number two, you can pray for people, but be aware if you rebuke, you may make the situation worse. Don't specifically address principalities over regions without specific things. Now, okay, number three is very important. Everybody read that out loud with me together. Ready, read. Don't specifically address principalities over regions without specific things. Now, I'm going to give you what these are real quick. Regional repentance, or at least remnant repentance. Regional repentance, or at the very least, remnant repentance. I'll tell you in just a second. Regional or remnant repentance. Here's what I mean by that. If I go to Las Vegas, Nevada right now, and I address the principality of gambling, and I tear it down in Jesus' name, the second someone is a, that's addicted to gambling puts the coin back in the slot and pulls the lever, they open the regional door again. If I go to Chicago and address and rip down the spirit of murder, the second a gun fires and kills someone, it opens it again legally to the territory. Is this making sense? I can address a thing and tear it down, but when I do, the second someone in that area opens themselves back up to it, it opens legal ground again. So, here's why it's so important. Because if you do it, if you go in and do it, you get a big old mark on your back by this enemy, by this principality. And if you're not prepared to legally deal with it, it will come against you and begin to attack you. This is why we have to use caution. Are you aware? Are, are you following me? So if I, as a pastor, only it's been 14 years since New Covenant Church of Atlanta started. Only in the past couple of years have I felt like we've gotten to a place where we've begun to address regional demonic influences. Because there's a remnant of people that's not ashamed to repent. We've repented of covenant-breaking activity. We've repented of, of fornications. We've repented of all these things. And because we repent of it, over this area, there's a regional tear in the spirit realm where this principality, these principalities have been ruling. And so now we can begin to address it. A year and a half ago, I stood right here and rebuked um, the uh, golden calf principality. And it was idolatry. And I felt it begin to be t torn down and ripped down because people were in a place of repentance. If I'd done it before, it would have, we would not have been in a place to receive that. Does this make sense at all? Okay, questions about this. If so, if you open, if you, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, gotta get a drink of water real quick. I don't know if I'm asking this the right way, but um, you said if you rebuke something in someone and it, they're not prepared for that, it can come back seven times worse. Is that the same thing when you're talking territory? Yes. Because if we begin, we begin to make regional differences, 
They can call for reinforcements. That's why sometimes when you begin to do warfare, things start to get worse before they get better. Um, but we don't want those things setting up legal territory. So, yes, Elijah. I was going to say there's a verse in the Bible where God is telling the Israelites as they're about to go into the promised land that they are to displace the enemy. And he says, I'm not going to drive out the enemy from the whole territory because if I do, the land will grow wild and what comes into the land will be worse than the enemy that was there. So it's, it's a law, it's a spiritual principle that whatever territory you want to take, you have to displace what's there. You have to maintain. Not, you, yeah, you, you can't just drive it out. You have to be ready to maintain what's there. That's it. Okay. All right. And then finally, don't One pursue question. demons, pursue Jesus. One question. Now, I want to, I want to, oh, question. there's an online question. Okay. Uh, so how can we pray for our cities? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. So how do we pray for our cities? We follow the leading of the Holy Spirit because I may not know how many people in the city have repented. I may not know how many people are ready to receive. So tonight, before we leave, I'm going to specifically address some things, and we're going to come into agreement that these things are being, are being torn down. They're being ripped down because we're ready to. So we pray for our cities. We begin to pray, God, here's one of the biggest things. Your kingdom come, your will be done in our city as it is in heaven, in this city, in this region. And, and we're going to talk about how to pray in part four with territorial spirits. I'm going to show you some prayer strategies real quick. Uh, same person. Um, uh, they don't understand what maintain means. What maintain means? Um, whenever we get delivered individually, prayer and the study of the word is, and worship. Faithfulness to the house of God. Basic discipleship is the maintenance. Um, Whenever we uh, regionally, when we, we begin to get delivered regionally, we have to maintain that through a consistent prayer life within the region. Because if we individually, if we get delivered and set free and we're not praying daily, we're not in the word. And I'm not talking about spending hours upon hours upon hours. I'm just talking about regular discipleship. Then that thing can come back in and begin to attack us again and attach itself to us. But that's what I mean by maintenance, regular prayer lives. Because how many of y'all know? Whenever you don't have a regular study life and you don't have a regular prayer life, you begin to get carnal. Then all of a sudden when carnality comes in, that thing can come back in and reattach itself. So that's how we keep it at bay. That's what I mean by maintenance. Are there any other questions or comments? Question. Oh, yes. Okay, another question online. Why do we pray that it is coming down and not that it is down? Or is that effectively the same? Um, it's, it's effectively the same. Um, we pray because God's kingdom, we, it's basically the difference between manifestation and a non-manifestation. The kingdom of God isn't necessarily manifested because we see it. I can go out the front door of this church and see that the kingdom of God is not fully manifested up and down the road. But I pray his kingdom come, his will be done. I believe his kingdom is, is about 75 to 80 percent manifested inside this facility. Um, I would give us a higher ranking. But but um, I know everybody. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> including myself, and, and, and I know us. I would give us a higher ranking, but we still got a little bit of that flesh hanging on. Um, <laughs> all right. And so kingdom come will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, let's take a five-minute break. Just five. We've got to hurry because I've only got 20 minutes to, to finish part four, and we're going to zip through this really quick. Um, get your questions ready, because I want to make sure we get questions and comments in. Are you all receiving from this? This is pretty deep. It's deep stuff. Oh, no. <laughs> now, I do want to say there is a difference between confusion and curiosity. Um, I felt, whenever I said that a while ago, I felt the Holy Spirit say, you know, people might be afraid to ask questions. Questions and curiosity is not confusion. Confusion is a different thing. Confusion is, is a spirit that tries to keep our mind in a whirlwind where we never quite fully grasp the love of God for our lives. Um, and, and I don't want a spirit of confusion. Amen? Amen. Let's take a break real quick. Hurry back.
Yeah. Start writing it down. Leviticus 17.11 is very important. Very important. So with the sacrifice, um, before Jesus died, the veil was not broken. And it was the people who had to afford the sacrifice. They didn't go immediately into the throne room. But after he died, those people who had given blood money sacrificed before they were credited to him. So they got credit cards, those sacrifices, because of the way they were given pre deposit of the blood. So I need to go back through that again. So I know, I know in my heart of hearts that I know there, okay, so if you read Revelation, there are animals in heaven. I don't know if they're my bucky, if they're my favorite, if they're the animals that were sacrificed. I do believe they have souls. They have minds and emotions. I'm not 100%, but I'm 90% sure that in some way God will bless these creatures, especially the ones that were. They hold special places for us. If we love these creatures, how much more does the Creator who knows every little tree and every bush in the world?
One minute, 45 seconds. One minute. Okay, 45 seconds. If everybody could, let's start coming around in 45 seconds. Ten. Hi, everybody online. Welcome back. We're so glad that you're joining us. Just a bit of information. We have 88 right now registered for Fire Institute. So a lot of you are online. 57 of you are online. So we are doing our very best to keep up with all of you with all of your emails every week. Again, send me the code. Email me every week, Pastor Joanne Castle at gmail.com, and Joanne is J-O-A-N. Don't put the double N in there. I won't get it. <laughs> Pastor Joanne Castle at gmail.com. The code for this week. Are you ready? Anticipation. Everybody in here, you don't have to write that down. It's only for the live streamers to send me. Thank you, Charlene, for that, but no. All you live streamers, code for this week is Hosea 1-1. Love you all. I'm so glad you're a part. And let's get this party started. All right. So now we're going to talk about territorial spirits, RKs and Archons, part four. Now, last week with part one, we talked about Walmart being an RK, an Archon, a principality. So whenever we talk about principalities and powers, we, um, and we're going to go more into this in the coming weeks, but when we're talking about principalities and powers, we are not talking about one devil. So whenever I say Jezebel, I want to give you some background real quick on how principalities and powers get their names. When I say Jezebel, I'm not talking about one little spirit up in the heavens that's there all by itself going, I'm Jezebel. And I'm not talking about one little spirit when I say Leviathan over here in the heavens going, I'm Leviathan. I'm not talking about that. Principalities, when we look at Walmart as a principality. Now, I'm not bashing Walmart. Everybody's clear. We look at it. It's made up of managers. It's made up of, of workers. It's made up of cashiers. It's made up of corporate. So here's, I mean, even if I just threw it out here, if you have a Walmart in an area, you have managers, floor managers, you've got employees down front that are working the cash register, and it all flows in great order, right? It's very, well, it's very uniform, very uniform. So I'm thinking of Target. Whenever, so whenever people come into the Walmart atmosphere, they all of a sudden see the price falling. They see, oh, I can buy air filters for, you know, two bucks for 12 instead of eight bucks for 12. So they buy into it. It's a buying culture, right? And so that's what a principality is. So when I say Jezebel, when I say Jezebel, I'm not talking about an individual spirit. I'm talking about a corporation of spirits over regions. So here's the earth, and you've got the United States of America right here on the cusp. Over the United States is maybe Jezebel, one of the principalities. But then when you start thinking of the depth and height and width and dimensions of the spirit realm, you start talking about Goliath. And I'll give you some explanations of why I would say Goliath is a principality. Not the guy that was a giant that died when David killed him, but a principality that influenced him. Okay, give you a quick rundown of principalities. Okay, if I say the spirit of Elijah... Y'all know that song we sing? Behold, he comes riding on a cloud. It's called the, 
days of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah. If I say the spirit of Elijah, who am I talking about? If I say the spirit of Elijah, who am I talking about? I'm not talking about Elijah. If I were to say the power of God is about to move in the spirit of Elijah, who am I talking about? Holy Spirit. I'm talking about Holy Spirit. Am I talking about the ghost of Elijah? No, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Elijah. If I say the Spirit of Jesus Christ, who am I talking about? Holy Spirit. Am I talking about, okay, so anyway, you get what I'm saying. So if I say the Spirit of Jezebel, I'm not talking about the ghost of the woman who was the queen married to the king Ahab. I'm talking about the spirit that was in the heavenly realm that affected Jezebel on the earth thousands of years ago. That spirit is very much alive, and it networks to influence people in the earth today. So when I'm talking about the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of Goliath, I'm talking about that spirit in the heavenly realm that affected the people in the Bible. This is principalities and powers. Are you all with me? So Jezebel can affect regions and areas, principalities, Leviathan, and it can be bilocational because they have corporations set up all over the spirit realm. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, we're going to go into right quick, very quick, I've got 10 minutes to cover part four, territorial spirits. I want to go over this one. Let's go to Acts 8, verses 5 through 24, and I need somebody to read that very quickly for me. Yeah, go ahead, Christy. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many were paralyzed or lame, were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city, and and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he, had, he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both the men and women. Simon himself believed and, wa- and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astu- ast- astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there and that, they m- that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized um, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, now in the the outline here, verse 9 and 11, it says they were amazed. Fill in the blank there, amazed. Now the Greek word is extemi. Everybody say exestemi. Ex meaning out and stemi meaning to stand positionally. This literally means they were beside themselves. They were outside themselves. They were literally beside themselves in the spirit because of the sorcery that Simon had uh, performed. So it was false spirituality. Everybody say false spirituality. And it was a spirit of sorcery. So he was probably bound by, he was probably doing little magic tricks that were very influential and not illusionary. They were probably actually coming directly out of the spirit realm. And this spirit of sorcery influenced Simon, who through that 
person actually ruled in a particular region. Because if you look at the next one, there's a territorial dimension. Verse 9 and 11, the people of Samaria and the Samaritan city. And they, them, all of them, underline in the, the five verses 5 through 24, all the places where it says they, them, all of them. What it's saying is basically this principality had deceived through Simon all of these people in a region. They were completely bound by this spirit. A city and people were held captive by supernatural means. A city and people. They were delivered from the bondage in verses 6 through 8. In the very beginning of the story, you see all of a sudden people were being saved and healed and delivered because one guy, Philip, came into the area, into the region, carrying the atmosphere of heaven, and he began to dislodge this thing through supernatural means. And all of a sudden they were no longer bound by the amazement of the spirit of sorcery. They were all of a sudden captivated by the spirit of God. And it began to break off this junk that was in the region. Now, they were delivered from the bondage in verse 6 through 8. And the rest of the chapter, they're baptized in the Holy Ghost. Verse 5 and 25, the word and signs and wonders tore down the stronghold so much that he wanted to purchase the power. Now, if we want to dislodge the spirits of Atlanta, the the principalities and powers that rule over this area, and how many of y'all want to do it? We want to. We want people walking in freedom. Then we have to operate supernaturally. Our advertisements won't do it unless they're saturated in prayer. Our Facebook statuses won't do it unless they're saturated in prayer. The only thing that will begin to dislodge the principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness over regions is supernatural means. Let's go on to the next one. Do you all see how this principality, do you see it in the scripture? A lot of people just passively read Acts And they don't actually see principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness. But do y'all see how the spirit of sorcery had this whole region in bondage? Do y'all see it? Does everybody see it? Yes. So if um, principalities and powers are what influence, like if you think of it like a corporation, Uh um, who's in, I mean, is it the devil directly that influences those principalities and powers? Lucifer is is the, is directly in charge. He's the founder and CEO of the kingdom of darkness. So, is everybody clear on that? Yep. Okay. Did I say yep? Did I hear yep or no? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Acts twelve one through twenty four, and I'm just going to run through the fill in the blanks and tell you the story. Verse one: King Herod was he he began to destroy people. Now here, over this region, was a spirit of destruction. Working through Herod. Now, Herod, I could go in. At some point, we're going to address the spirit, the principality of Herod. Um, Herod, this principality, the spirit of destruction, functioned through Pharaoh to destroy a generation of boys uh, to try to kill Moses. It also functioned through Herod to destroy a generation of boys to try to kill Jesus. These are two stories in the Bible. One, uh, a whole generation of, of kids were killed, and the same in another generation of kids because the Spirit seeks to destroy the generation. Um, so here, this Herodian spirit, the spirit of destruction, was trying to kill the early church. Now, in verse 3, after King Herod had, had killed off, I think it was, who is it? Uh, James, thank you. He killed James. Verse 3, it says, this was pleasing to the Jews. Now, if you highlight that, underline it, and do a study in the Greek, word, in the Greek, it's the same similarly as the existemi of the, the Samaritans. This act caught all the people in that region and pleased them. It excited them. So the Spirit worked in a region to captivate people. Verse 5, prayers were offered up continually. Prayers. Everybody say prayers. Now in verse 7, immediately when the church began to pray, and let me give you an illustration here. Imagine it this way. Randy Morgan is leading a revival in the city of Atlanta. And everybody's like, ah, we need to give our hearts to Jesus and all this kind of stuff. Devils are being cast out. People are being healed. The mayor of Atlanta goes, I don't like this. So he has me imprisoned and killed. 
And then they don't like it. So then, the, I mean, the people like it. The people all of a sudden get really excited because they're like, oh, praise God, you know, happy, happy, happy. He's, he, the, the troubler of people, Randy Morgan, is gone. And when the mayor says, oh, but they like that. Well, then we're going to target Pastor Johnny. Okay. <laughs> so the mayor comes after Pastor Johnny. The church becomes aware of this strategy of the enemy to destroy. All of a sudden, all of y'all know Pastor Johnny's in jail. They done took me out. So all of you rush into the church and you take a knee. And everybody's voice begins to cry because you don't want Pastor Johnny to die. You don't want that to happen. All of a sudden, all the voices begin to rise. Then in verse 7, we see angelic power released. Do you notice the angelic power was not as active until the people of God prayed? When James was killed, they arrested Peter. But all the church came together, took a knee, and began to pray, began to lift their voice. Now, verse 23, we see judgment on Herod. And in verse 24, the word increased. You got those lines? We see judgment on Herod. And then verse 24, the word of God increased. Now, the last two lines. Prayer and the word equaled victory over an influence over a people. Next week, I'm going to start about five minutes early because <laughs> I'm going to do a tutorial on how to wield the sword of the Spirit in doing prayer and warfare. Okay? Now, are there any questions about this? When, when the people of God begin to pray, that's how we're first going to start dislodging principalities, powers, and rulers of wickedness over areas. We need to come together and begin to pray. New Covenant on Sunday mornings, we need to begin to lift our voices. We need to come around this altar and pray on a regular basis. Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights. We need to begin to lift our voices and pray the word of God. We need to speak the word, and it's going to begin to dislodge these principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in heavenly places. Okay, any questions, comments, concerns? I rushed through that last one. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Some understanding? Okay. Okay. All right, come around the altar real quick. We'll dismiss. Online, I'm so excited that y'all were joining us next week. We're going to begin with, um, I believe it's Goliath, I believe is the next chapter. And we're going to talk about tearing down principalities that seem bigger than all of us put together. Hallelujah. Whew. Father. So often, the enemy has legal ground. And it hinders people from hearing the gospel. And it hinders, the enemy blinds the minds and hearts of people. Father, we are studying these things so that us here at New Covenant Church of Atlanta, we can move into the spirit realm, the realm that we're not super familiar with yet. But we can move into that realm and begin to take authority that you have given us. For so many years, spirit of poverty has held people in bondage. For so many years, Goliath has frozen armies in place and the armies of God and they've not moved forward. For so many years, Delilah has deceived God's people and stripped them of their strength. For so many years, Leviathan has choked the waters. For so many years, Behemoth has been a consumer and not a giver. For so many years, these principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness have held sway over generations of people. But tonight, we come together even with the beginning of the shedding of light on this subject. And we're going to begin to lift our voices. Over the next several weeks, we're going to begin to renounce covenants with things that have held us back. We're going to begin to tear down the golden calves that have held sway over generations of people. 
And out of this place is going to rise a war cry like has never been heard since the foundation of the world. Out of this place a cry will be heard. A war cry will rise. Intercessors will rise with power in their voice and strength in their hands and understanding in their hearts and minds. And a war cry will rise and the Jericho walls will fall. In the spirit realm, Jericho walls have been built around generations of people, but those are about to fall. We're getting insight into the Word of God about how the kingdom of darkness works and the kingdom of light is about to be turned onto areas that have been hidden from us. That have been hidden. And those roaches are going to begin to flee to the north, the south, the east, and the west. There's something about to happen. And God, right now, as we continue further on with this study... I plead the blood of Jesus over our minds, over our hearts, over our lives, over our homes, over our cars, over our work. I declare the blood of Jesus is sprinkled upon our hearts and lives to protect us and guard us in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, this is going to shed new light. We're going to come in here and, and, and instead of going, why do people wave flags? There's a scripture that says how beautiful are the people of God. They're like an army, like a troop warring with banners. So we're going to come in here and all of a sudden we're going to be waving flags like an army that's just going in and saying we're tearing down strongholds. And all of a sudden flags just aren't something pretty we do, but we're actually doing something in the natural that affects the spiritual. Da, Hallelujah. We're going to be tearing down territory, tear, tearing down principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness. This is exciting. Are you all ready for the next level? God bless you. You are dismissed. Don't let one person leave without a hug.